Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this month's webinar, um, talking about feeding growing horses. Um, it's something that I find really, really uh, a neat topic to talk about, and there's some new information. We're always trying to make sure we have strong, sound babies, and, and really um, the feeding of those mares prior to pregnancy and throughout pregnancy is a big part of it, but we're, we're going to talk about the, the foal today. <clears throat> so we will touch a little bit on those in utero requirements, a bit of that postnatal uh, requirement. So once the foal is born, are we going to change the feeding? What should we be concerned about um, after the fact versus while they're in utero? Um, <clears throat> and some of the disorders that we worry about with young growing horses and the role of nutrition and perhaps look at some ideal diets and adding in the DAC products and see how we can, um, <clears throat> excuse me, make sure we're feeding a, a nice complete diet. If I can get the slide to change. So why is it important to feed young growing horses? Well, we're not just looking at the horse and saying, oh, we want a great baby. We want to have a future athlete. We want this horse to grow up and be a racehorse or a barrel racing horse. And typically these horses aren't just going to have one career. You know, I've seen a lot of the thoroughbred makeover project as um, all of the invites are going out at the moment and seeing these cool stories about horses that have been Kentucky Derby prospects, steeplechase horses. Now they're going to go into the thoroughbred makeover. You know, horses are expected to have several careers and be sound in every single one of them. And I'm seeing horses live longer. So not on, not only are they going to have several careers, but they're also expected to live to 25, 30. And again, be sound in all of those years and all of those careers. So the re it really, really, really makes it so very important that those of us that are breeding and feeding young foals and brood mares, if we want to set those horses up for a lifetime of success, then we need to make sure that we're laying down a good foundation. You know, if you want a house to last forever, it starts at the foundation. You know, you don't want to get to 50, down, 50 years down the road on your house and think, oh, gosh, that foundation wasn't very good. Look, one half of the house just fell off. So we need to make sure that we're really um, putting down that strong, sound base. Minerals, um, you know, what, what's happening in a lot of our young horses is we're seeing a lot of futurities, a lot of young horse classes in every discipline, whether it be barrel racing or race horses or quarter horses or dressage horses or jumping horses. Not only do we want them to live a long time, but we want them to mature early. And so we're asking for rapid skeletal growth. Um, <clears throat> so we need to make sure that the minerals that are being deposited in the bone, we need to make sure we're feeding the best quality minerals to make sure that they're highly available to that young growing animal so that we give them the best chance. Um, if we don't have the best quality minerals and nutrients, then the uptake's going to be poor and we'll have a poor foundation or a poor skeleton. So that's why feeding is really, really critical with these young animals. So if we look about, at, if we go all the way back to before breeding, um, why I always, my anecdote is that when's the best time to feed that foal before the mare even goes to the breeding shed. And if we think about it that way, then you can look at, um, different minerals, calcium, iron, copper, zinc, cobalt, iodine, manganese, and selenium um, are really, really important in the fertilized egg cell before implantation and after implantation. If you look at the vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin E, we've changed all of the vitamin E in all of the, the products over to natural vitamin E. It's so critical. Um, B vitamins, healthy hindgut. A horse is going to produce its own B vitamins only if the bacteria in the hindgut are healthy. Vitamin A also comes from, from fresh forage. So we want to make sure that we have our mares on a good, strong, healthy plane of nutrition, balanced vitamins and minerals, not overweight, not underweight, before she ever goes to the breeding shed. And that will increase your chances of um, of pregnancy, of, of implantation, not just getting her pregnant, but also that we can, you know, not just fertilizing that egg, but we can implant that um, oocyte so that we can have a healthy, successful pregnancy. So in early gestation, what are we looking at? 
<clears throat> well, you know, it's the first six months of gestation. Early embryonic loss is a, is a big issue. Now, a lot of horses can get pregnant, but it's the maintaining of pregnancy, maintaining a pregnancy, having a strong, healthy uterus, um, a, a, a healthy uterine lining so that we can implant and, and maintain that pregnancy. So, the feed that you're feeding in the environment in that first six months is really important. Again, having um, zinc, copper, vitamin A, vitamin D are all really important in that first, uh, first six months. The first 40 days is really the most critical when we're talking about early embryonic loss. And as you can see from the graphics on the right hand side there, you know, we uh, by, by day 40, we already have quite a, a, a little equine structure there. Um, by day 24, at least, you're seeing a heartbeat. Um, it's really developed at, by day 18 to 20. It's, it's really quite developed at, at day 24. And we know zinc, copper, vitamin A, and vitamin D are, are really critical there. Now, vitamin D, if horses are getting it out in the sunlight, then they're going to be fine. They're going to be converting their vitamin D. If you have horses that are living in stalls, then vitamin D supplementation can be beneficial. But copper and zinc, these are two minerals that we make sure that we're feeding chelated or organic forms, meaning that they're really much more bioavailable to the horse. Uh, we look at mid gestation, that month seven and eight. So that uh, the requirement for energy and protein starts to increase because we're gonna start laying down a little bit more tissue and um, fat. Um, we've got about 90 grams per day of fetal growth. So it's growing that fast per day. Somebody can probably quickly do that on their um, Google and tell me how much that is in ounces. But uh, vitamins and minerals, again, really critical for that fetal development. The heart, you can see there, iron, selenium, another one that is really critical to come in organic or, or chelated form. Zinc, copper um, for the heart, copper, zinc, kidney, zinc, iron, brain, iron, copper, zinc, lung, copper, zinc, bone, calcium, magnesium. Now, what are the minerals there that are recurring over and over? Copper, zinc, selenium, copper, zinc, selenium. Um, and so it's really, really important that we make sure that those are being provided in the diet. Late gestation, months 9, 10, 11. Now this is where that foal is going to gain about 80% of its body weight. We're looking at a half a kilo a day, which is about a pound a day growth. This is where we're going to start fortifying those fetal livers because mare's milk is really low in vitamins and minerals. Um, so we need to, that mare is going to start pushing in that last late gestation, she's going to start pushing minerals into the foal's liver. And it's going to hold them in that liver so that once it's born, it's going to start utilizing those stores through to, and that's going to hold it till it starts eating its own food. And we get real uh, an increase in muscle fat and, uh, and increased mass. So in utero, if we have... Um, not enough calcium in the mare's diet, so she's not actually able to to put, put that shunt that over to the foal. We're going to have depressed bone mineralization. So um, really, that foal is is really quite cartilage. It's full of cartilage. Uh, we don't get a lot of bone mineral. Um, during um, fetal development, but towards the end we do, and we want to make sure that that foal is being born with some bone mineral. It's going to keep developing, so I want to make sure that that mare is getting plenty of calcium in her diet. Calcium's um, there's different sources of calcium, but calcium is pretty available, so we don't need to look at chelated sources of calcium. Vitamin A status: low vitamin A during pregnancy does affect fetal growth and the health of that newborn. So a few different things: if the mare is on a diet that's low in vitamin A, the things that you'll see in that foal once it's born, um, you may not see reduced organ weight, but that would be an issue. Um, lowered elastic fibers. Well, where do you think elastic fibers are, tendons, connective tissue, delayed lung maturation and reduced gene expression. So any of your horses, you know, I think uh, when I think of organ weight, the first organ that I think about is the heart and we want to have a good, strong, healthy heart and we want to have strong, healthy lungs so that when that foal is born, um, 
you know, they've got good lung capacity, good strong heart, that's going to start them off well. Mares at pasture, vitamin A deficiency is pretty rare. But as we've been talking over the last months, year even, we know that most horses don't get plenty of access to pasture. Now, hopefully our brood mares do. And if you're if you're lucky enough to be in Virginia or Kentucky, Tennessee, then we do have a lot of pasture available. But a lot of our horses, unfortunately, don't get um, access to pasture, a lot of our performance horses. So with your brood mares, really do make sure that they get access to vitamin A. Um, it's going to be in the um, breeder's Choice Plus, that vitamin and mineral. So people ask often, what's the difference between the DAC Orange and the Breeder's Choice? Well, the Breeder's Choice is going to have slightly higher um, vitamin A content and selenium content to, to take into account the added requirements of these broodmares. So here you can see um, kind of those copper stored in the fetal. So this wavy line here, that's month of pregnancy. Um, and what you're seeing here, 9, 10, 11, we're really starting to fortify that fetal liver. But then as soon as the foal is born, those, those liver stores start to decrease all the way down to five months of age. Really by three months of age, that foal is being weaned off uh pushed away from the mother she's start starting to slowly wean them and they're going to start eating their own food source um One thing that I would be cautious of, any of you that have heard Dr. Duran or myself talk about different supplements, we are really not a fan of any supplements that contain seaweed because the iodine content can be very variable um, and that can be really, really a problem in broodmares and in young growing horses. We don't want to make, we don't want excess um, iodine in the diet. It can cause um, weakness, depressed mus muscle um, development, contracted tendons, um, long hair coat, all kinds of things can occur in these young foals uh, if we have excess iodine. So if we look at the macronutrients, so we've looked at more the micronutrients, the minerals, the vitamins throughout pregnancy. Um, now those macronutrients, the energy, the protein, really when I think about energy, I want to keep the energy sources coming from high quality fiber sources as well as fats. I don't necessarily want my broodmares eating a lot of sugars and starches, unlike my racehorse or my barrel racing horse that do need a lot of sugars and starches to go quick. Perhaps those high amounts of sugars and starches in the broodmare can um, cause some growth issues. So I want to keep the energy sources for broodmares coming from high fat and high fiber. So looking for feeds that are going to contain high fat and high fiber. But also we're really looking at the protein content. Um, when we think about protein, we really want to be thinking about the quality of protein, those amino acids. And the analogy, the picture that I like to use is the barrel analogy. Um, lysine is the single most important amino acid for young growing horses. And it really, if you look at the barrel on the left, so this is this is a barrel and each one of the slats represents a different um amino acid, lysine, methionine, leucine, isoleucine, valine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, threonine. But unfortunately, you can only fill this particular barrel up to the level of the lysine there. So it doesn't matter that there's this much methionine and there's even more um, leucine. You can't use any of this additional amino acid above the amount of lysine that you've got in the diet. Think about it like you can't fill that barrel up above the lysine slat. So you need to make sure that you're feeding adequate amounts of lysine and then it will allow you to utilize those other amino acids. So we want to make sure there's good quality protein sources in the diet. And where are they going to come from? They're going to come from alfalfa legumes like alfalfa, soy, um, soy, soybean meal is a really ideal protein source for horses. Canola meal. Um, if you feed your horses a very basic oat, hay type diet and you add supplements to it with young growing horses and broodmares, you absolutely need to add alfalfa. Um, so you need to get that quality protein. Uh, if we look at those, this here is m more for your own um, just reference point, just looking at 
the um, weights of these horses at six months, 12, six, four, six, 12, and 18 months of age, average body weights, um, average daily gain, or the amount of milk that's being consumed. Um, it'll, it'll switch over. Um, digestible energy contents here, um, that's how much they will need per day. Crude protein, lysine, calcium, and phosphorus requirements for each of these different age groups. And you can see that these young growing horses really need a lot of crude protein, but elevated amounts of lysine. It's not just about the type, the amount of protein, but it's about the quality of protein. Um, and then when we look at foals, weaning, yielding, 18 months and two years, if we look at the amount of forage to concentrate ratio, um, you can see here uh, that put on as a percentage of body weight. So that's really just a slide for your own reference. So some common questions that I get about young horses is, well, when should I start feeding them? Um, the mare's milk is a primary nutrient source, but it's, as we've mentioned, it's not a primary nutrient source for those vitamins and minerals. So we needed to make sure that we were um, feeding that mare a balanced diet. So she was fortifying the fetal liver. If you look at this graph on the right-hand side, you can see that really around three to four months here, the, the energy provided by mare's milk really drops off and the energy required by the foal significantly increases. So here's where we get this energy deficiency. So um, right around three months is where I say that foal should start eating its own food. You should start giving it its own um, ration. Um, and if you're weaning around five or six months, then you absolutely want to make sure that that bowl is adapted to whatever you're going to feed it uh, after weaning prior to um, weaning. So three months is usually when I start feeding them their own ration. Now, if I'm worried about growth problems, I'm going to start feeding them about 21 days of age. Um, and there, here are some different creep feed options if you're concerned about the foal either eating the mare's food. You can put the mare's food up higher. Maybe you've got a brood mare that is thinner and she's put all of her energy into the foal. So you've got a chunky little foal and a thin brood mare. So you're feeding the brood mare, you know, high calorie diet and you don't want that foal getting it. You want the foal to get more just a basic vitamin and mineral and the mare to get her high calorie diet. Then you can put hers up higher and um, use the creep feeder for the fall. So some of those problems that we're concerned about, these developmental orthopedic disease, which is really an umbrella term, and it includes osteochondrosis, physitis, which is just swelling, um, limb deformities, flexural deformities, and then also deformities in their vertebrae. I think this here, this is a good table because it's the approximate time of the onset of clinical signs and sites involved for some different skeletal issues. Now, if we're, if this is the time that we're seeing the clinical signs, and you know, prior to that, under the surface, we've had a lot of activity. So just because this is when we see it doesn't mean that's when it started. It started way earlier than that. So osteochondrosis, well, we can see that as early as three months through to about 20 months of age. Um, so right around that two years. So if you're seeing it by clinical signs by three months, then if you see it at three months, chances are that problem started in utero. Uh, and that was more of an issue with what you were feeding the mare versus, um, you know, what you were feeding the foal once it was born or perhaps genetics as well. Maybe the earlier on, it's either what you were feeding the mare or more of a genetic issue. Physitis, two to eight months. Um, angular limb deformities, one to six months. You can see those very early now. That can also be the size of the mare. There's a lot of other things that play into it, flexural deformities, um, wobbler syndrome, vertebrae issues. Uh, you can see those there. So at birth, horses only have about 17% of their mature bone mineral content, right? Um, there is still a lot of cartilage in the bones. Um, but so once they're born, we really want to lay down good quality minerals. At 60 days of age, a horse should grow at least 75% um, of their mature wither height. Most 
uh, lower limb growth is complete before the yearling phase. So again, I'm, I'm setting the stage here that um, you really need to, as early as possible, you need to be making sure these horses are getting adequate nutrition. You know, just the mare's milk and just the hay or whatever they um, have access to it is, is not enough. You need to be supplementing these young horses. By 18 months of age, the average light horse will reach 90% of their mature height. So people call me and say, you know, I've got a two-year-old and I really want him to grow taller. There's really no chance of that. He can fill out more. We can develop his muscle. But by by two, um, you know, he's pretty much re reached the height that he's going to be. Now, as you'll see a bit later on, actual maturation of some of those bones takes a lot longer. But let's start out at the beginning. So we'll look at the fetus and look at that bone. The the This blue color here, that's cartilage. And the black dots, that's the beginning of bone. So in the fetus, we have all of this, the bones, our limbs are just all cartilage. And then we have these things called osteoblasts. They start in the very middle of that bone and they are bone depositing cells. So these live in the cartilage and they're going to start making what we call the spongy bone. And they're going to slowly fill out, fill out and move their way to the ends of the bone. Um, in the late fetus, so, you know, 9, 10, 11 months, and in the neonate, we are going to start to now also get some osteoblasts in the very tips of those bones. Um, and so we get these two separate centers here, and that's what's going to form these growth plates. Once the foal is born, um, we're going to start, or late, late um, gestation, and once the foal is born, we're going to see this marrow develop right here in the middle. So right where back where the osteoblasts started colonizing first, now they've moved all the way along. We've got the spongy bone, we've got this growth plate, and on the very ends here, this darker blue, that's hyaline cartilage. That's the cartilage between joints that they're going to stay with for the rest of their life. Um, and in the middle, we start to develop bone marrow. You know, in the adult horse, that bone marrow extends full length of the bone. You can see that that growth plate has converted to bone. And this is a healthy, good example of how it's supposed to work. And we have this hyaline cartilage on the end. Now, in the, in the senior horse, you'll notice that this hyaline cartilage starts to get thinner and wear away. And that's when we have um, osteoarthritis. But this young horse, we've got this nice thick layer of cartilage here. So growth plate conversion to bone. Um, you can see, you know, conversion to bone in the short past in between nine and 12 months, long past in 13 to 15 months. But what I think is really interesting down here, what I've got highlighted in red, we're now looking at numbers between three, three and a half um, for the scapula up, up in the top parts of the bone. So it's easier to see if we look at this picture here. Um, the, as we go up here, the, right up along in the top here, this dark red, that's the last to develop along the, the spinal cord. It's going to be fully developed by six years of age. And here, these bones here, this is what I really want you to take notice of, is these bones in the tops of the horse's front legs here. Um, they're going to take, and up here into the scapula, they're going to take three to four, by three to four, they'll be fully mature. Now, I want you to think about different horse activities we're doing with young horses. Let's think about quarter horse racing, barrel racing, cutting horses, reining horses, these futurity horses that are young, they're right in this age range here, and they're bones and may not be fully developed yet and it's that sideways motion I don't know that I've got a slide but if you think about a barrel horse or a cutting horse that sideways torque that we're putting on these bones here from the scapula down to the knee joint that sideways motion is putting a lot of torque on those bones so what does that mean it doesn't mean you know, great. Yeah, I'd love to be able to say we take away all these young horses, your horse classes, because these horses aren't developed, but we're not going to be able to do that. We can't take those away. So what we need to do is make sure 
that we have really strong developed young horses. So we need to make sure that we're feeding chelated minerals. Why? These chelated minerals are much more bioavailable. They're going to absorb into the bones. They're absorbing into the, uh, the system a lot better than inorganic minerals. And so if we can't stop this early riding and early talk on these bones, then we want to make sure that we're supporting these bones as, as much as possible. Now, can we perhaps by using really good quality chelated minerals, and, and not all of them is, are the same, can we perhaps speed up bone maturation? Well, perhaps we can, in, you know, speed these numbers up a little. But if even if we can't, we want to make sure that these bones, these limbs are as strong as they possibly can to withstand all of that sideways motion, that torque. Um, so... We know that there are a lot of factors that play into this developmental orthopedic disease, nutrition, genetics, this injury, stress, the mechanical that we've just talked about. Um, so we, we can control nutrition though. Um, and again, I harp back to, you know, feeding is so important in those early days because nutrition mistakes early on are amplified. They are exponentially amplified and mistakes you make when feeding the broodmare while she's pregnant and that young growing foal, they can make or break the athletic performance of an adult horse. Uh, so it's really, really important. Uh, energy, we want to talk about calcium, phosphorus, copper, zinc, mangane manganese. Now, you know, you you saw early on, we looked at the minerals, um, copper and zinc were over and over, they just kept coming back as really important in that young growing horse. So um, it, it's evident that they, uh, there's been a lot of research done on copper and zinc. We'll touch on some of it. Um, digestible energy. Now that's really the first one. It's the easiest one to see in horses. Your horse is fat. It's eating too much. It's got getting too much energy in its diet and it's not expending enough energy. So um, excess energy will increase the horse's growth rate. Um, it can also increase the horse's activity if we're feeding a lot of sugars and starches and it's kind of making that foal a little more hyperactive. Um, you know, when they're crooked, crazily running around, it does put more stress on those um, limbs and bones. Now, that's not to say that you want to lock falls up because actually exercise helps lay down the fun function of pressure and stress on those bones does help lay down calcium and strengthen those bones. So we certainly don't want to lock them up, but we don't want them going crazy either. Um, and we don't want fat falls. Um, that is going to predispose them to just a lifetime of, of issues. And you look at a horse. He, all of his weight is carried in his trunk and he's got four skinny legs and four even smaller hooves that all of this pressure is going to be on. So we want to make sure that we, you know, we, we don't have these fat falls putting all of that extra weight on, on what may be through nutrition or genetics already compromised limbs. So fat falls are not a great thing. Um, you know, this is looking at glucose and insulin. So we're talking about these high sugar starch diets. Um, we, we really look at glucose. We're thinking about when we're doing research, we're measuring glucose and insulin. And you can see here, healthy foals here, right here, this dark kind of gray line. Um, then this is the that's the glucose value, plasma glucose, the dark gray line, and the dotted line here, that's their insulin. So in healthy foals, their glucose and insulin is normal down here. But in horses with osteochondrosis or growth problems, their glucose and insulin is way up here. So it shows you, you don't want to be feeding a lot of cereal grains, your oats, your high sugar and starch feeds to horses that have these growth problems because it'll just exacerbate the problem. Also, think about mare nutrition as well. You know, your brood mares really don't need a lot of sugars and starches. They're not going fast. They don't need that quick release energy. They need good quality energy coming from fiber and fat. Um, Folds with really high um, 
glucose and insulin had a, a much higher incidence of OCD. So again, we want to make sure that we're feeding lower carb diets to our young horses and our brood mares. And, you know, we talked about body weight, that having a really fat foal sitting on those four limbs really is not great. Um, so again, our high fat and fiber diets are ideal. Uh, just because a high, high diet is high in digestible energy, it doesn't mean that that is going to cause the horse to get growth problems. Um, what happens with a lot of the horses that we need to push faster, you know, unfortunately, I don't like to do it, but we do work with a lot of clients that are uh, are having horses go to, to young horse sales and, and they need to be more mature quicker and they need to grow faster. And so if we're going to do that, we need to make sure that we're really um, matching energy and protein because people think protein is bad. Oh my gosh, it's going to cause growth problems. Absolutely not. If you don't feed enough protein, I guarantee your horse will have growth issues. Protein is critical, but protein and energy kind of go hand in hand. And if I'm going to push the push the horse and get him to grow a little quicker. I need to make sure I'm supporting him with additional protein and with ad additional minerals and, and vitamins and, and be really intensively managing that horse. If I see any kind of deviation from normal growth, I'm going to slow down. So it really isn't just kind of throw the food and, and let him grow. It really becomes a more of a sci science project and you've got to be monitoring them very closely. Um, Excess protein, as we mentioned, often implicated, but never has it been supported by research. I repeat, never, there has never been a study that showed that protein, excess protein, caused a horse to have growth problems, period. High protein does not make the foal grow faster um, than a diet that meets NRC requirements, and there's no effect on increasing the protein on the incidence of developmental orthopedic disease. Study after study, I've listed two there, but there are several, hundreds of studies. Um, now, let's look at low quality protein, though, low protein, and talk about the quality of protein. If you're just feeding a local grass hay and oats, then that is not going to be the quality of protein that your horses need for growth. Um, and we'll see impaired growth uh, leading to potentially your growth issues. And you really, protein is such an important part of bone and cartilage development. You need good quality protein. Calcium and phosphorus, these are the other two that we often think about when we think about young growing horses. Um, <clears throat> excess calcium, as long as you've got enough protein, is generally not a problem. Um, high calcium, really, really high calcium can um, decrease zinc, manganese, and iron absorption in other species, but not in horses. We just haven't seen that in horses. Um, if you have a lot of calcium, we really just need to make sure that we bump up the phosphorus to support it. Um, optimum ratio is two to one calcium to phosphorus. Maximum ratio in um, m mature horses can be about six to one, um, but in foals, we can go about five to one calcium phosphorus. And Unfortunately, with a lot of the local grass haze that we're seeing on the East Coast, um, and, and really a lot of places for that matter, because we're not really allowed to fertilize with high phosphorus fertilizers anymore, um, we're seeing a lot of local grass haze that are quite low in phosphorus. So you need to take that into account. Deficiencies in calcium or phosphorus, we know that they can cause bone problems. Um, as we mentioned, no reports of up to five times the calcium requirement being an issue. Copper, copper, we keep talking about copper and zinc. Copper deficiency can cause developmental pro problems. Why? Because it's a big part of the cartilage formation. Um, you saw in the young fetus uh, how we had, it was all cartilage, and then we have those osteoblasts, and then we have the growth plates, and then we have cartilage on the ends. We need to make sure that we've got enough copper so that all of those cartilage development stages happen correctly. Um, these are several different studies looking at copper um, requirements in horses and, and what happens if you feed too, much, too little copper. Um, 
So again, I've got these here. If people start to question you, you've, you've got research to back it up. We need to make sure that we've got adequate copper in the diet. Deficiencies in zinc, again, can cause developmental problems because again, it's important in cell replication. Well, what do you think those osteoblasts were, those bone cells? They are creating, they're replicating to fill out that bone. So zinc's a really important part of that. Um, protein synthesis as well. So we need to make sure if we have really, really high um, amounts of zinc that will have decreased calcium absorption and decreased copper absorption. Um, but again, that's, that's really not ever an issue in horses. Um, this is a study looking at standard red foals where the, the mares were not being fed a fortified diet. They were just on just hay and oats, no vitamin mineral being fed. 50% um, had OCD lesions. 28% of these horses had lesions in more than one joint. Um, so that, that, that's a big deal if, if you're making your bread and butter on, on young horses. So I want to go back to talking about the chelated minerals really quickly because not all chelated minerals are the same. And unfortunately, there is a lot of people out there that are trying to claim that theirs are the better ones. And so I want to, I want to just break it all down so you know what a chelated mineral is and what to look out for. Um, and so if we use this little analogy that in the intestinal lining, there are doors for minerals to go through, right? And this inorganic mineral that you dig out of the ground, the rock type mineral, um, well, it's only got one door to go through. But if we attach that inorganic mineral to an organic substance, i.e. making it a chelate, making it how the animal would see it in its natural form in pasture, for example, it's going to be attached to an organic substance. What we do is attach it to little proteins, amino acids, then we know, well, protein's really, really important in the horse's diet. So there's a, lots of different doors in the intestinal tract that uh, open up for protein. So now by attaching the zinc to the protein, we get a much higher absorption of zinc because it's now going through not only the zinc doors, but it's also going through the protein doors. So that's what we say, that's what we mean when we say that these chelated minerals, when they're attached to an organic substance, have much better, higher bioavailability. This particular one here. So really the term chelation just means attached to something. Uh, keel means claw, so attached to something. But when we, when we think about the American Association of Feed Control Officers, they go one step further. And if we're talking about chelated minerals in the sense that they're supposed to increase bioavailability, then there are only five different forms of chelated minerals and they have to be attached to an organic substance um, that are recognized as feed grade chelated minerals. This here, zinc hydroxychloride. If you see that in your feed ingredients, that is not an organic substance. Hydroxychloride is just another inorganic. So sure, it's a chelate in the true dictionary definition of a chelate because you've put two things together. But in the definition of an organic compound that we're increasing feed efficiency, increasing bioavailability, then this is not zinc hydroxychloride. That is not recognized by AFCO. It is not a chelate. It is not going to increase feed uh, a bioavailability of this nutrient. Um, we use proteins or, or peptides to attach to these minerals to make them more bioavailable. And the primary reason is we, research has shown us. Can everybody still hear? Everett, can you hear? Okay, good. Yes. Okay, good. Sorry, somebody said they couldn't hear. Sorry. Research has shown us that protein, um, you know, we, we know when we attach these minerals to proteins, we just have the best bioavailability. So when we, when we look at this kind of timeline of effect, 
months, under eight weeks, under four months, new wean, weanling to yearling and the possible nutritional causes and, and what you're actually going to see. You know, I mentioned with some of these things that you're seeing very early on that if that's when you're seeing the clinical sign, then something has been occurring way earlier than that in utero. So with this under eight weeks, then you're seeing that um, developmental issue in the horse, then that is most likely something that you were not feeding the mare during pregnancy. Um, so last thing here, I'll just talk about what we're gonna feed these horses. So if we have a fall, that has developed some kind of um, joint issue. When I typically, if the foal is three months or older, I'm gonna wean the foal so that I have 100% control over everything that's going in their mouth. We're gonna take the whole mare milk out of the equation because really what we're getting out of mare milk is energy and protein. And, and we probably don't need all the excess energy that this foal is getting because I, you can't really slow the growth down per se. It will continue to grow, but you just want to keep them, keep the growth more consistent. You don't want to have these spikes in growth. And, and we know that, you know, a mare, let's say a foal is born in the, in January, late January, and the mare doesn't have any grass to eat. So milk, milk content, their protein and energy is just coming from whatever, um, hay you're feeding them and then we get to the spring maybe april so that fall is four months old january very much april four months old and we have this increase in spring grass then of course the milk content in energy is going to go way up so i want to take that out of the equation um and i'm going to analyze the diet and if we've got swelling with heat so inflammation and we know from past webinars that inflammation is the beginning of all bad things, then we want to make sure that we, you know, slow, slow down their exercise level to prevent any extra damage, maybe do some cold hosing. And what minerals are we going to add? Okay, if we're looking at a, a DAC program, we're going to look at something like the Colt Grower, the CMZ paste, what is that? Copper, manganese, and zinc um, as a therapeutic dose. One look at the, most people, the first thing they do is, well, I'm going to cut all the grain out and cut back on the hay. Well, you know, you need to make sure that you're feeding them vitamins and minerals. You don't want to take everything away. You also need to give them adequate amounts of protein. So don't just take all the feed away and think you're going to starve it out of them. Um, we're going to restrict that growth rate. We want, to, we want to control energy intake, but you absolutely need to maintain protein, minerals, and vitamins. Common mistake, as I said, is to take away all of the nutrition. So this is a typical PACE diet here. You know, we're at, um, we're still going to feed some alfalfa hay. Um, we we want to make sure that we're giving adequate amounts of copper, zinc, selenium. See, I'm even giving slightly more than this 100% requirement because I know that growth is compromised already. And I want that growth to be supported. So I'm going to add additional. So you can see here, we've got, you know, free choice grass hay, you know, two ounces of your colt grower and a couple of pounds of alfalfa. Now, depending on the size of the horse, that might be half a pound up to two pounds of alfalfa just to give you that quality protein. So in summary, mare nutrition is the key to fall health. All starts there. In utero, you've got to make sure that you're building a sound foundation Give that mare adequate vitamins and minerals. Give her adequate nutrition so that she can start building that. You know, you hear the saying, I'm eating for two. Well, you are eating for two. The mare is eating for two. It doesn't mean she needs to gorge on, on calories, but she certainly needs to make sure that she's supporting the foundation with the minerals. And that will give you strong, healthy foals, which what do strong, healthy foals turn into? They turn into athletic performance horses. So, questions? If nobody asks a question, I'll feel terrible. It was a little longer than normal, but you can tell I like this topic, hopefully. I'll unmute everybody. Susie, ask your question. Good, <laughs> Good morning, Tanya. 
Um, recently had a client's veterinarian pull her young horse, who's just 14 months old now, um, off of our colt grower because she felt she had an allergy to the soybean base. Oh, my God. Um, the foal was just looking kind of poorly. They did fecals. There were no worms. Um, the coat was going kind of south, the eyes, and she was coming down with, with symptoms of allergies. Um, have you ever run across that with our colt grower? Absolutely not. And I would challenge that vet that it had nothing to do with the colt grower. I would have been evaluating the rest of the horse's environment. I would have been evaluating the hay that that foal was eating. Had that foal also gone through any other sickness, we know that 100% of foals that go through some kind of stress event um, have impaired gastrointestinal lining and that in itself if you've got toxic material floating out of the intestines and into the bloodstream that right there can cause those allergy like symptoms and that ill thrift it had nothing to do with the cult girl okay well that that was 